much for inviting me. I have to say it's slightly embarrassing to have to talk about one's curatorial practice because um, it's something that comes out of one's work as a scholar. And, um, and then to be reflective about what one has put out there and analyze one's work is a bit uh, tricky. And so, <laughs> because this is, uh, I think a lot of my scholarship actually just comes out in the form of curatorial practice without having to be discursive about the discursive action that I've already taken. And, <laughs> and so now this double remove that I'm being asked to perform is a little tricky. Um, so I guess thank you very much for the opportunity for making me do this. It sounds very straightforward that we all need a database on the basis of which we can categorize information. Every discipline requires its own type of data to be categorized. The ways in which art history is categorized poses very genuine and unique problems that are greatly in need to be addressed in India at the moment. What limitations do we face in India has been something of some concern to me. Metadata, spelling and nomenclature conventions? Yes, those are serious problems. They're not minor. We also need to seriously think about visual lexicons and iconographic vocabularies. They sound like very pompous words, but let's try. What are the needs for art history in a digital age? This is going to be the subtext of what I'm going to try and speak about. These are matters to be revitalized on the basis of the research that we are doing now. How can we make archives more receptive to what we need? One way would be to start recording how we are presenting our data. The nature of our institution's investment and the maintenance of digital archives, in linking separate archives, in thinking about the copyright conventions and lexicons, I think all the things that we've been doing over here for the past two days has made it clear that we have in no way threatened or diminished the work that is being done conventionally by librarians and archivists who already work in our institutions. What it has required instead is more than double the job market, a market which is woefully inadequately populated at the moment, and a market which is keeping the entire education sector of India arrested, if not actually making it vulnerable to a very serious kind of neo-colonialism that we are confronted with at the moment. And I shall come onto this last point at the end of my talk today, if I get some time for it. But first, allow me to fulfill this conference's stated aim, which is, how curatorial narratives open up creative and critical ways in which collections and museums and materials and archives can be made more accessible and public? And in what ways have I tried to fulfill that endeavor? I shall focus on the matter of opening up of job opportunities for dozens of philologists and iconographers who have to work alongside data retrieval specialists and those who build algorithms to enhance the digital recognition and sorting of data through the course of my presentation. Digital content providers have to work alongside those who already work in a field, in the field of print data. Just as a documentary filmmaker opens up an entirely new media platform which works alongside conventional research, so does the digital. What we have inadequately under understood, therefore, is how an entirely new industry has opened up, which in no way diminishes, as I was saying, or replaces the existing pedagogy or specialization. In fact, what we have not really understood is that the digital is not an indulgence, but a massive requirement for which we are financially unprepared as a nation and as professional communities. Opening up an entire sector of jobs, one would imagine, would be advantageous to government policy. The infrastructural requirements that come with it, however, are a financial burden, for there are unsatisfactory models of revenue generation that are attached to it. How will the investment and maintenance costs of these archives be met? Well, coming from my discipline, my problem is that we're not even producing art historians anymore. The theoretical term has made issues more attractive than data content. Balancing the respect for visual language and taxonomies alongside the seductive analytical paradigms for post-structuralist and post-colonial research 
is not what our institutions can provide. I observed with some sadness on entering JNU to discover how irrelevant the remit of pre-modern art was to the academy. I realized quickly that the complacence of pre-modern art historians had allowed it to be painted into an irrelevance on the one hand and also been entrapped in the valorization of religion and tradition. Those who valued it were seeking a celebration of Indic religious tradition, and those who were seeking contemporary social relevance in the humanities, on the other hand, were assiduously trying to shake off the Orientalist trapping, the casteist imprisonment, the colonial limitation of religious tradition. Where and how, then, was the canon of Indian art to be located? How was the museum, the archive, and Indian art to be made socially relevant. I'm depressed to tell you that after two decades of teaching and working in art history, I have a handful of students, barely, whom I can rely on to help me as assistants in my big curatorial projects. Seemingly simple and good research is in fact extremely hard to develop. Even primary documentation has not been done in India and we're already tired of it and we want to jump into meta-narratives of interpretation. Curating major large exhibitions, which I've done, please understand and please cut me a little bit of slack if you can, in national institutions under the auspices of my government. I have to put that out as a caveat because doing it in those restrictions means that I'm not talking about minor archives being created, I'm talking about national archives being mobilized. Curating major exhibitions like India and the World or the Body in Indian Art allow us to focus on what problems there were for building cultural capital in democratic ways or how the museum can emerge in India as a space to address diverse publics. Language, leadership in Indian museums, how is the subaltern to be represented in contemporary times, these exhibitions forced us to look at all of these matters. Examples of primary data that has opened up in the two exhibitions I worked on well, I'll try and show you some of that first. What I tried to do was present data for scholarly attention for the first time to show how it upsets taxonomies and chronologies of styles and iconographies. So the intention of the exhibitions on both cases has not been to seal a subject, but it has in, fa in fact been a very conscious endeavor to open a subject because there is so much that has been lying uncatalogued, uncategorized, lost and forgotten in different archives, that those were matters and issues that needed to be brought out rather than be put in. So these catalogs of these exhibitions serve as a starting point. And I was hoping that each of the books that have come out of this would serve as little manuals for students who are looking for MPhil and PhD topics to be able to open up on any page and say, here is a topic that I can work on for the next five, 10 years. And that's exactly what I hope these two catalogs have provided. So the slides I hope will be self-explanatory as you look at them because you'll see the kind of things that haven't been cataloged in art history texts. We also need to think about who is consuming art history these days. We need to separate potential consumers and those in the industry already and therefore ask, if the archive is providing them data in accessible ways. And here we mean that, is it going to be in the languages of the people whose art it is? And can they come and follow it in the museum? And can they follow what we present in our archives? Because it's in a language that they understand. Now, quote unquote, our folk and tribal art to be a part of Indian art history, an audience like yours will not find this we, we, you'll say, oh, what a silly question to even put up there. But the institutions in which I've had to work have questioned this fact because this is not a part of the canon of Indian art history even now. So for us, it might be passe to even pose this question, but it certainly isn't in the national narrative of Indian art when the National Museum puts up an exhibition. To the extent that the body in Indian art made sure that every single gallery created an interface in some way between the different kinds of voices of the contemporary, whether it was print culture, 
um, whether it was studio practice or whether it was the so-called folk and tribal uh, classes of Indian art. The India in the World exhibition, I made sure that when India is presented in this exhibition, it is bookended the entire exhibition, the beginning and the ending of this exhibition was with works that would definitely not be considered high studio art practice, but was about living traditions of India that would actually be brought into dialogue with creating dialogues for how the very subject and discipline of ethnoarchaeology becomes a problematic thing for the archive and for the nation to be able to deal with. How are we going to contend with ethnoarchaeology? How is oral history going to be maintained? And how is it going to be presented? This was a serious concern, and this has been a concern for both exhibitions. And um, to be able to present that, and I feel like a bit of a failure, because despite having done it three times over now in Brussels, Bombay, and Delhi, I am quite aware that the message hasn't quite got to where it needs to get to in the institutions of the ASI and with the National Museum, where this might not be a narrative that they fully comprehend. <laughs> so, a few examples, you know, how we start uh, the exhibition with people's voices and people's art, memorial stones to the actual biographies of people. Um, we began the exhibition with uh, objects from the Northeast to approach India from the Northeast rather than to approach it from any other uh, geographic zone. We um, tried ways in which to be able to make po a point in an exhibition through the scenography and we used exhibition design strategy as a way to be able to enhance the narrative which is not something that is often understood because you have to leave the method of curation also as something that has something to say something to contribute to the entire uh, to the entire archive and the aesthetics of what it is it's not just the object that was in question but it is the exhibition itself that needs to be archived and to be able to communicate so this was a massive gallery with a skylight um, and that posed conservation problems what kind of glass do you use to cover paintings um, to be able to allow them to be exposed to skylight um, what do you do with it in the evening? And how does the evening light complement? How can it be made to complement the kind of artwork that is on display? Um, how do you work in situations where you want to create juxtapositions between the contemporary and the traditional? Um, and how do, you, how do you create those dialogues? How do you reinforce them in different ways in the exhibition? I'm gonna race through my slides because we really don't have time. Um, Trying to bring an ar archive of ethnoarchaeology and make it relevant to art history, well, one of the challenges and ways to do that was through the law that surrounds uh, Mariamman, Hariti, Sitala, the many different kinds of jeshtas um, that exist, and putting all of these goddesses together in a significant section on the matrika and rebirth allowed one to explore those conversations. Um, on. There are new questions that emerge which challenge, which challenge chronology, religion, and language as we have understood them. When does iconography in India begin? Does the Harappan period have a bearing on later Indian art? Were the Calcolithic cultures Hindu and Brahmanical? Were the, was the Harappan age Hindu and Brahmanical? Well, you know, these aren't easy questions to answer. There are no simple answers to these questions. They are very politically volatile matters. And the museum houses tricky bits of evidence that have to be interpreted afresh and looked at again and again. Um, we, there is another question that happens. Major exhibitions and presentations cause a certain problem. Now, as important as the canonical masterpieces of the Gupta period are. There are also vast numbers of bronzes and sculptures that come from the post-Gupta period around the seventh century, which are seldom seen in exhibitions, although there are extraordinary sculptures in situ at major monolithic <coughs> sites all over India. General surveys of Indian art often jump from the fifth century epoch of classical Gupta art to the 10th century phase of high medieval statuary. Images from Mansoor in Madhya Pradesh, Badami in Karnataka, Kannauj, in Uttar Pradesh, Achutrajpur in Odisha, Pallava sites in Tamil Nadu, Hindu Shahis in the Northwest Frontier, Peva in Haryana, massive sculptures, both original and one perfect facsimile 
from Chhattisgarh and others that date between the 6th to the, to the 9th centuries, that is, after the Gupta period, were brought in to extend the question of the canon and what is regarded as the period of idealized classicism. Similarly, the 10th to 12th centuries become another benchmark in standard Indian art histories with the Pala, Chola, Chandela, Pratihara, Solanki constellation. And that in itself is often so overwhelming to most art history textbooks that they care not to actually talk about all the other <coughs> things that are happening in India at the same time. And those things just get left out of the archive left out of every major national exhibition. Despite their power and mannered stylize, stylization, Kakatiya sculpture from Andhra Pradesh has, or Telangana has seldom found a space in exhibitions or collections. The display of many extra canonical paintings that come either at, the, at either end of the Mughal and Rajput constellation, for instance, similarly, also cause a problem in being lack, in, of being sort of forgotten. So, these exhibitions have provided an opportunity for fact-finding and to look at these marginalized epochs, extraordinary things that came to light which people hadn't quite noticed previously. When we looked at these sort of things, I mean, this sculpture from Chhattisgarh, few people realized that the sculpture is in the shape of a Nagadev. The entire surface of it is sculpted into scales of a snake. The sculpture itself, however, is made of a stone which naturally degrades in the form of snake skin. So the theme and the iconography is in tune with the material that has been used. How often has obsolescence being considered by classical artists in the making of an artwork. We look at, we, we so rarely, when we talk about Chola bronzes, how few actually talk about Chola Buddhist bronzes? How few even know about the fact that there might have been Buddhist enclaves in southern India? How few books really talk about Vijayanagar bronzes? Um, these have been no small amounts of concern. Um, the museum contains all kinds of evidence which needs to be dug out and presented to the public afresh. Here's another example, an Achyut Rajpur bronze um, in Bhubaneswar. So few people have seen these bronzes since they were excavated in the early 1960s. <coughs> Objects were taken um, for this exhibition which, are, which have never been accessioned before. So this was found in the pile of the rubble behind the Qutub Minar it is a portion from the Kubatul Islam Mosque. <coughs> Every exhibition provides an opportunity to use the evidence kept in our archives and museums to address burning social and political questions for its times. This was also done in India and the world. So we began with a series of hand axes from different parts of the world. The display of these hand axes showed that, well, firstly, no one is an Indian, which meant everyone is an Indian. The hand axes were used to show that, um, that these are beautiful objects. They are made for an aesthetic purpose. They are not made for utilitarian purposes. And therefore, aesthetics is intrinsic to our species. And if aesthetics is intrinsic to our species, art and therefore museums too should be intrinsic to our species. Indian art making is as old as it is in the rest of the world. So that was an interesting thing. And the nationalists were happy to hear that. Um, and Indian means something that was from South India, North India, East and West India. So I had to produce hand axes from Chittor and from the Northeast and from Chennai and from Daimabad and from different parts of South Asia to be able to show that the Stone Age was something that man had settled in India in all parts of what we call the nation state of India and not just in one part of India. Then we come up with issues of national identity. Now, of course, some of the most wonderful things now lie in Pakistan. And so, how are they going to be labeled in the exhibition? Are they going to be considered part of the narrative of Indian history or not? And this isn't a small problem, because the museum doesn't want to use the word South Asia, and it wants to use the word Indian. And the Pakistan High Commissioner isn't very happy about it all. Um, so so there, are, there are issues like that. Um, these 
projects have provided an opportunity to be able to dig out objects that in or provinces of India that don't even have museums to showcase these things. So these extraordinary Harappan discoveries, for instance, that are shown in the current exhibition on India and the world, come from a state that doesn't have a state museum. Similarly, these were put in the body in Indian art. Haryana has more than agriculture and highways, um, and this is something that few people knew. Um, <laughs> There are unpublished artifacts in the exhibition. For instance, um, the finest collection of Chinese porcelain, of Chinese blue and whites in the world, the oldest collection of imperial Chinese blue and whites in the world, were excavated in Tughlaqabad here in Delhi. And um, this is one of the dishes that come from there. Um, there were narratives about traders moving across the world. The scenography of the exhibition was used in innovative ways. But as I was saying, the museum preserves evidence. Evidence? from times past, which was acceptable in a different time, but is today regarded as being blasphemous, for instance, or doesn't follow a particular political line. So the painting on the far side, on my far side, is a mirage that was uh, painted, that was displayed in the body in Indian art and thought in Brussels, and the one on the left, which comes in the National Museum's collection, which is even more compelling because the prophet's face is not concealed by a sehra, but is there in plain view. However haram it may be for Sayyid Bukhari in Jama Masjid, the fact of the matter is that the museum contains paintings from Herat, today run by the Taliban, which actually have paintings of the Prophet that did exist and were in the collection of the Sultans of Delhi. So the museum does have these things. Are we going to ignore the evidence? There are barely any books, as I said, on Kakatiya art and sculpture yet. We have various hero stones, the Veera Sati and Veera Kals. Is Sati being exonerated in South India by them? Is it equal to have Apsaras waiting on men and women in heaven? Questions of gender come up in these exhibitions. Are women never permitted to have pleasure outside of marriage? Because you see, the female goes up to heaven and she too has Apsaras waiting for her, just as the Veera Kal has um, Apsaras waiting for him. There was another reason why we began the exhibition with these sculptures, because jihad and martyrdom in Christianity remain volatile political debates. So were there Hindu martyrs as well in history? It's an important question to be posed in the current environment, and here is the evidence. And then, of course, there is the famous one, is one man's martyr, another's criminal, or another, you know, this constant debate that is going on. Well, here there was evidence once again by linking it with the contemporary so in each portion of these exhibitions, we've taken contemporary works and associated them with historical ones to make the historical evidence in the museums relevant. On one side of the sculpture from Kannauj, you have Tara. On the other side of the sculpture, you have Ardhanarishwara. The same sculpture has been reused. Is it a case of iconoclasm? How are you going to document this sculpture? In the category of Buddhist art or in the category of Hindu art? Are you going to pose the question that this is a case of iconoclasm, or are you going to pose a question where you show this evidence as saying, well, well, patron changed his mind. Artist made a sculpture. He thought he was supplying it to one entity. That entity no longer wants it, gives it to another, turns the sculpture around, carves on the other side. Perhaps, perhaps it isn't a case of religious rivalry. I'm not saying it is, but the evidence needs to be out there for you to be able to interpret and do what you want, what you want to do. Who perpetrated the violence on this particular sculpture? Who decapitated her? Malinath is meant to be a Jain Tirthankar. But according to Jain tenets, women can never achieve moksha. The best a woman can do is to be reborn as a man so that she might become, she might achieve moksha during the second incarnation as a man. In which case, you can't really have a female Tirthankar statue. But was it that in certain branches of Jainism, Prior to the 11th century, there may have been a counter-opinion of women who felt that they had the right to achieve moksha. And was their sculpture silenced? If so, who by? Every object in these exhibitions is selected for multiple reasons, many of which are not even understood by museum personnel or conservators or art historians. You don't get the, you don't get the meaning of the works selected for these shows in one go. 
The intention is to be able to allow for multiple viewings to be able to get the point. For instance, this sculpture in the Amravati style. Now, when curating India in the world, a standard question being asked to me, because the collaborating institution was the British Museum, was that, was this exhibition going to provide an opportunity for the restitution and the repatriation or the reparations that are due to India from the UK? Will the UK be sending its Indian treasures to India for India and the world? And of course, we weren't even asking for a single Amravati sculpture from the British Museum. And the question became, well, why not? Well, we said, well, we'd like to see what the British Museum can give India from the rest of the world instead. So I selected a work from the site of Fanigiri, which is in the Amravati style. And the work shows the story of Siddharth leaving his palace and throwing away his kingly turban because he doesn't want his inheritance or materiality. And the turban goes flying up into the sky. And every turban contains within it a jewel. And the jewel, the money that lies in Siddharth's crown, the entire top of the sculpture you see is in the shape of a turban. And inside the turban, there is a jewel. And the jewel is Siddharth's turban. It's the sacrificed turban. He who has let go of material wealth is the one who, who doesn't need it anymore. He, that is the true knowledge that he has on his path to Buddha. Very evocative story, made a very major political statement in, in the exhibition. But then it also posed an important question. If we're not asking for the reparations, if we're not asking for repatriation, we are at least asking for an equitable terms of sharing knowledge. We're share, asking for an equitable terms by which the knowledge that is mobilized by the possession of that object is at least shared, because that is something that cannot be denied to people in different parts of the world. And so the exhibition forced into sharp focus the matter, ma different kinds of matter, that not even people don't even view history and time in the same way that perhaps the way in which history is being presented by the victors is not quite the way in which history is seen by the National Museum of India or will be read by the nation state of India. Right? So can the British Museum give India a narrative for world history or is India going to try and come up with its own voice in the narrative of world history? And therefore the conclusion of the entire exhibition is based on a, a word, on, a, on, an on an exhibit, which talks about the idea of homogenization in the world today, an artwork called Unicode by Tallur. So the point is that the museum and archive must permit these varied opinions to be showcased. And this necessity was itself made the conclusion of the exhibition, how multiple points of view will always accompany an archive. So we come to the conclusion of my talk, which is really about this requirement for the decolonizing of knowledge. I think Sita spoke about it earlier today as well. Visual lexicons and iconographic vocabularies, which I've been talking about, the needs for art history in a digital age are dependent on the terms at which knowledge is gathered and shared. <coughs> Will all the platforms for art historical research, archives, and research and archives move to the West? Will we in India, have to license access to knowledge? Are we going to be, because we are Johnny come latelys and we seem to be reveling in our grogginess constantly at being Johnny come latelys and never actually waking up to the fact that we have to initiate archives and museums, but we just keep waiting for it to be done unto us and then eventually, you know, saying that, oh, somebody walked off with the knowledge as well? Well, did we learn nothing from the entire colonizing process? Um, well, because, you know, that is why we have, I mean, it was very strategically positioned in the exhibition, and this is what this artwork was really about. Johann Zoffany, as the artist, refusing to be categorized as a performing monkey, as a supplier of knowledge and fact. I'll be giving a talk about this painting in Calcutta on the 6th of April, and maybe in JNU next week, um, next Friday. I don't have time to talk about it more today. But this painting is precisely about the terms at which knowledge is gathered and the terms at which knowledge is shared. And who is going to control that? It's broken into the very composition of this painting. 
what is the main nature and the role of the artist as how he sees himself. And he's not smiling as he paints this self-portrait. As he looks at Claude Martin and Antoine Collier, divvying up, on the one hand, gathering the raw materials of India, pointing to it on one side of the diagonal, and the other red arm going to the other compositional extreme of the diagonal, at the port of Farhat Baksh, the home of Claude Martin, from where these uh, raw materials of India are going to be exported. The poor Hindustanis are divided up in this painting into works of art from which they stare at us. The artist likens himself to a performing monkey, gathering this knowledge which he's put around himself. It is a painting in which the frame which contains Antoine Collier shows the dying Hindustani and the cremation of the Indian above. The extreme right shows worshipping of a new dawn on the ghats above and the red coat Englishman taking over the landscape of India. The artist in the center looks at us along with the people who are trapped in art in the central frame. You only get people who are looking at us. The two Indians who are trapped in the painting, the monkey, and the only person who is a true human being, who is the artist himself, who is narrating how the largest collector of knowledge is gathering that knowledge, Antoine Collier, is this big manuscript collector taking the manuscripts of India to, to Europe. And how the artist, Johann Zoffany, in the center of it all, is narrating all of this in a very dry way. And he's not amused by what he sees with the dissemination of this knowledge. So I end, Shruta, with something that you've left me and all of us with. We haven't really developed in our institutions adequate tools to really be able to think about how we are going to deal with a knowledge of the image and the different ways in which the image is to be categorized and what kind of knowledge systems come encoded with the image and how the image is being used. It is particularly apposite, therefore, to revisit Rux Media Collective's important work which is quite exciting because it's going to be shown in the National Museum of India very soon, to be able to really see how issues that we are concerned with politically are going to actually be dealt with by the nation state and therefore by the archive. I'll leave you with that.